investments and mentorship can play to make this a vibrant and successful uh, sector. Just the homework on this sector has been truly an eye opener for me. I'm going to tweak the format a little bit vis-a-vis uh, -vis just asking random questions to panelists because we have on our panel three people who are a repository of quite a lot of knowledge in India and overseas. And to tap into their vast reservoir in just an hour will, will not do justice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each panelist a series of three questions in context and then do follow on questions. Let me start by first sharing some information that I gathered on the affordable housing, low income housing segment globally. And they were truly eye opening for me. Globally, did you all know that there is there are 1.6 billion people who live in inadequate shelter, a number that will increase Am I audible? Yeah. Am I audible? A number Absolutely. That, yeah, a number that will increase by 2050 if no action is taken right now. The data for India suggests that in our country, urban housing shortfall has written, risen 54% to 29 million in 2018 up from 17.78 million in 2012. And what's more concerning is the fact that over 40% of the Indian population is expected to live in urban areas as against the current figure of 34%. With this background, let me now welcome our guests to share their insights. Let me first start by welcoming Rajiv Katpalia, who's a partner at Vastu Shilp Consultants, the multidisciplinary practice founded in 1955 by the renowned Ritzka laureate, Sri Balakrishna Doshidi, who has been awarded the Padma Shri and the Padma Bhushan and known for buildings like the prestigious IIM Bangalore, IIM Udaipur, NIFT, amongst others. Rajiv himself, with several international Indian awards under his own belt, works to integrate frugal and environmentally responsible strategies to create habitats for people and is renowned for his institutional design and has won several awards both in India and across the world. Designing across a range of scales, Raji's practice encompasses regional city plans, institutional campuses, individual buildings, and even furniture. What's exciting for me, his net zero approach to campus design integrates architecture, landscape, ecology, energy generation, and management, both human and mechanical, while creating equitable and inclusive social milieu which has set new benchmarks for sustainability and innovation. Welcome, Raji, to the session. Manish Kumar, who has sincerely apologized, uh, he will be 15, 20 minutes delay. Manish works for the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs and is the regional coordinator, Pradhan Mantri Awaz Yojana, Housing for All Mission, Ministry of Housing, Government of India. Manish has over 15 years of experience in the development sector, having worked on participatory planning multi-stakeholder engagement, institutional capacity building, project management, and empowerment through multi-stakeholder partnerships at all levels. We thought it was very important to get Manish's overview from the government perspective in this segment. And now finally, I'd like to introduce Lizanne Costa, who, who's an Associate Director of Entrepreneurship and Innovation for the Turbiliger Center for Innovation and Shelter, and leads the global efforts to raise the profile of affordable housing in the entrepreneurship innovation ecosystem and expanding shelter tech. She is based out of Zurich, Switzerland, and has worked closely with members of the managing board and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, serving as project lead responsible for development and implementation of the strategy for global digital platform for startups. For those of you who are not aware, shelter tech is the world's leading platform for affordable housing, innovation, advancing entrepreneurial shelter solutions that can radically improve the lives of low-income families within, within programs running in South Asia, Indian region, or South America, India, Mexico, and Kenya. So let me start by, I was actually supposed to bring in Manish's perspective from the government on what is affordable housing and what is the difference between affordable housing and low-income housing. We will ask him this question when he's back, but let me start with Rajiv. Rajiv, Aranya Low Cost Housing Development in Indore 
conceptualized in the 1980s, accommodates over 80,000 individuals through a system of houses, courtyards, and a labyrinth of inter internal pathways, and was awarded the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. Can you share three questions to you? Can you share more insights on this and other low cost housing developments you've been involved with, which were conceptualized and implemented thereafter? That's question one. Let me hear you on that, and then I'll ask you the next two questions. Are you over to you? Rajiv, you've frozen. Okay, so while, and this is, this is Murphy's Law Technology, let me move to Lizanne. Rajiv, can you hear us? Technology. Okay, Lizanne, uh, you're in Switzerland. Uh, let me ping you questions till Rajiv gets back. Uh, you work with affordable housing sectors across different countries. Uh, thank questions. you, Manish. Uh, uh, thank you, John. Uh, I think locally, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Can hear you, Rajiv. Uh, can, can you hear me now on my back? Broken. Uh, uh, John? Can you hear me? Yeah, bro, breaking, uh, Raji. Oh, that's a pity. Um, I okay. think this better. internet better. connection business is. Let me see. If I can... Yeah, is that better now? Better, much better. Okay. Uh, you hear me clearly say yes, then I'll start answering no, your Raji, question. No, Raji, not clear. So let me repeat the question. No. Yeah, uh, you're frozen it's again. So okay, so Raji, when you while you get oh, your internet back, let me, uh, no. yeah. let me move to Lizanne. Uh, Lizanne, you've been involved with affordable housing across different countries. Three questions to you. Are the challenges and issues across developing nations similar? And where do you see similarities and differences? Hi, John. Thank you very much for the questions. And I think the internet is a bit unsettled because we have so many people here in the room. So everyone, thank you very much for joining. And I think also in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, sometimes things happen and are not working perfectly. And that's completely fine because we are the change makers, right? And we are the ones who wants to pilot. So we will also stay in the room when things are not working perfectly, I hope. So thank you again, John, for the question. Um, just to give a bit of a context, you mentioned before that we do have a global housing deficit where 3 billion people will have or will need access to adequate housing by 2030. Of course, we do see similarities um, and also challenges in the drivers of inequity in housing. And people are experiencing this inequity because of you know, different levels. So on a systemic level we, or a systemic bias, we have political, social, economical, and environmental level. Then we also have different trends within the different countries and regions, right? Such as, for example, migration or climate change or even humanitarian crisis. And right now, globally, we have also a pandemic. So on a high level, we see very much similarities. Of course, in the details, we see a lot of differences. Let's say, for example, um, climate change, a trend which we see, which we have to act. In the Philippines, this might be um, a bigger issue than in other countries where we have, for example, um, 24 typhoons every year, um, which we have to consider in if we are um, looking at who we wanna serve and who we wanna support as startups. Um, maybe also, again, as a context, Habitat for Humanity serves around 9 million people um, per annum. So on one side, we have the low-income households in the center of our work, where we do see um, differences in, in, in challenges and also opportunities. On the other hand side, we need products and services which are addressing their needs. And we see there that um, startups and scale-ups have a huge potential to, to actually face these challenges and to solve these challenges. And also there, we have to take into consideration um, the countries and the regions they, they live in. Um, 
for example, we, we see on a high level again that um, sometimes the potential of the startups, they do not see how they can reach the market, right? So this is a, something high level. We see, for example, that sometimes they have challenges to see the business opportunity, even, you know, it's, it's quite, the number is quite impressive, right? Um, and then we also see that there is less capital and less support in the different countries of those startups. So this is for sure um, a difference. So this is a gap we are trying to close as also shelter tech, right? As you mentioned before, um, we are having different um, initiatives to really be a platform where we can advance entrepreneurial shelter solutions that can radically improve the lives of low income families. And we are having different initiatives um, where we are looking at, you know, again, the regions, the countries those startups are in and why um, and what is also very important, how we solve those, those differences is we are doing an ecosystem approach. So we are very delighted to work, for example, um, with, with other accelerators or with other um, organizations and corporations with that also, for example, we work closely with, with, with you, um, Brigade Reap, to really promote affordable housing. Great. So Lizanne, you know, you talked about working in different countries. Obviously, there's a lot of collaboration you do with corporations and, and, uh, and institutions. Can you give us an example of the kind of collaboration and partnership you have in different countries, including if you have any in India? Sure. Um, so I, I would like to start first with the collaboration we have with you, um, with, with Brigade Reap, right? So looking at the past, um, EcoSTP, I think, is a beautiful example how we collaborate. So EcoSTP um, has a unique patent and technology which treats sewage, uh, sewage without power, chemicals, or human interventions. Um, a fantastic company. Um, Brigade Ria did a fantastic job and still does a fantastic job to really support them in their journey. And the collaboration we did was they're now an investee in the Shelter Venture Fund, right? So this is something we can focus on um, in India. But we then also do have, um, for example, with the two accelerators we're we are running right now in the Andean region one and the other one in Southeast Asia. So globally, we are having two accelerators um, right now. By the way, um, they're coming to an end in, in um, mid-July. Um, so there will have also a big event where, where you all um, are invited to as well. And um, we are working with Hilti Foundation, Autodesk Foundation, and also DAO um, within, within these um, two accelerators. And they are mentoring a lot. So they have people on the ground, like in the countries, in the prospective countries, who, they are to, um, who are giving their time and effort, opening up their tech camps, um, their knowledge, their connections, and giving really the startups visibility um, in their different countries and regions, which is, of course, on one side, amazing for, for the startups, but then also amazing for those um, organizations and foundations, because as we all know, um, to work with, with startups as well, um, has a huge benefit also on the innovation power within within a company, right? And um, there's really yes, a mentor mentee benefit. Okay. So in the same way, since we talked to a startup, you talked to EcoSTB, which was a truly disruptive company when we found him, and he's now going all over the world, recognized by the UN and stuff like that. Can you share examples where you have seen startups uh, delivering value props in the affordable housing, low-income segment, which can apply in India, in Mexico, in Philippines, any part of the world. As you question, <laughs> we can go anywhere. Yeah, I mean, um, scalability is always something we dream of every startup, right? Every startup we also invest in or support into that they are our poster childs very, very soon and can scale in di into different regions. Um, so yes, we absolutely believe that the you know the current cohort, for example, we are seeing right now also in the two different regions, um, will be those poster childs. I can give several examples. Um, Sampangan from Indonesia, for example, converts waste into useful materials through a magic box they are creating, and um, also there they're working, for example, closely with the government, and they are 
they just secured a contract to process 150 tons of waste into construction materials in Sumatra. So I think also to see the process of waste turns construction material, that's something we can see and hopefully Sampangan will be one of the, um, of the companies who can scale because this is really a trend we are seeing also in the circular economy um, space. We also see, for example, in Chile, let's, let's go to the other side of the world, um, hope they develop um, a mobile modular shelter for emergencies. So, or for example, also now during COVID um, medical facilities um, where, which, where, which are the, the, the shelters are mobile, they are easy to sanitize and, and comfortable. Um, what else? And then we, for example, also have um, Kuba Modular. They're based in the Philippines. Um, they're manufacturing also modular homes made of bamboo. So again, materials um, might be not scalable, you know, everywhere in the world, but where, you know, where, for example, bamboo, we also have in several areas in the world. Um, and they are installing um, frames with, with bamboo and they actually um, were a word winning and sold out already throughout the entire year. So um, of course we believe in all our startups and, and, and want them to succeed. And for that, we're doing a lot. And maybe to also right. give a number, um, we have more than a thousand um, mentorship hours within those two accelerators in just a few past months. So, you know, interesting that you mentioned this. We have two startups, Angiras and Structure, which is actually turning agri-waste into, into panels that will compete with wood and engineered wood. And we mm -hmm. have Angiras, which is working with construction waste and plastic waste to create wicks, which will compete with bricks. Uh, thank exactly. you. Thank you, Lizanne. So, Rajiv, you're going to be uh, on video off, but would like to now move the next question to you. Can you share insights? On, on, on Aranya and other low cost housing developments you've been involved with that were conceptualized, implemented after Aranya and what are the challenges you had? Yeah, um, can you hear me clearly now? Yes, loud and clear. Good. Um, look, low cost housing is a bit of a misnomer when we use that term low cost housing because I think the term to use should be habitat. We are talking about an entire habitat. Nice. And when we talk about that, it means that there is not only a home, but also supporting physical infrastructure, roads, electricity, water, and sewage disposal, but also social infrastructure like schools, colleges, dispensaries, parks, gardens, and shopping nearby. And then there have to be opportunities or places of work nearby, uh, opportunities to produce things from home because a lot of the economy actually revolves around small workshops and small uh, manufacturing and services that uh, people provide from these homes. So I think it's necessary to think of this a little more holistically and call it a productive habitat. So that's the first part that I'd like to sort of clarify about Aranya. Aranya in Indore was a site and services scheme on 80 hectares and uh, it was designed for 8,000 families. So that's about 40,000 people. Today it's sort of reached double figures because of its success. But um, it, it was first and foremost about giving tenure to land. And I think one of the biggest problems we have is affordable land in, in our cities. And so that's why you have slums and squatter settlements because the price of land is a major issue that we have to deal right. with. Uh, Rajiv, we've lost some uh, money now. I can hear you. Can you Rajiv, hear me? Losing you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, now clear. Okay. Uh, so so the, the, the what I was saying was that, you know, uh, Aranya was about 80 hectares. Okay. Which was about uh, giving tenure to land in this case. People who had who were squatters were given tenure to land, which is about 35 square meters each. And this was service land. That means it had a toilet and a kitchen court with water, electricity, and sewage and roads. And the challenge was how to make this affordable in capital as well as operating costs in the future. So, I mean, when you give a place like this, it's it's part of the city. Uh, will they have underground? pipelines? Will they have disposal, proper disposal of sewage? And I think these were things that generally sites and services problem, uh, had problems about the costs of it. And so we looked at innovative ways of how you could half that cost. 
And uh, I mean, if I was to share drawings, then obviously we could see that in more detail, but today we won't be doing that. Uh, it's about spaces that could be doubled up for production also. So when we say, you know, you make uh, affordable infrastructure, you're also saying that the way you design this, and design becomes very important, that the way you design this, that space is multi-use space. It is not only for the infrastructure, but it is also a place where production can take place, where kids can play, where festivals can be celebrated. And all of this, I think, adds to the viability of something that you want to make as a home. Um, and of course, one of the most important things was that, I think, how do you empower people? And once you give them all of this, then I think people find ways they use the technology that is most affordable to them. So technology comes as a second this thing in this to say that, well, okay, um, as per their needs, when they grow, because incomes grow, people change, family size changes, kids grow up and go away. Some kids come back and settle down with their spouses. So, I mean, we have a dynamic situation where I think we're not talking about a house or so many square feet. We're talking about living entities, living families. And I think they, they go through change over time. And the dynamics of that change, if you recognize, that means you want to add a room, another bedroom. If you want to rent out that room or your, your son or daughter comes back with their spouse and you want to use it for them, you want to start a workshop, can you do all of this? And I think this is that, um, you know, the incremental growth possibilities, even in a small plot, by adding vertically and sideways, then you do that, that becomes very, very tricky. Uh, then you can use bricks, concrete, or bamboo. It doesn't matter. I mean, whatever is affordable. And you have the number of people participating increases exponentially. It's not like you have to produce so many homes in a given period of time. It is actually talking about that people will find their solution and move on from there as long as they have a place to build on. So, and that is serviced. So I think that's the key to your first question. In fact, Rajiv, I, I, I take out an interesting uh, uh, one-liner from you, which is productive, flexible habitat. Because unlike in the uh, upper income groups, there is no not so much five-bedroom homes in the in the in the productive uh, habitat. The key thing that I that I took out from your 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 first answer. Your second que my second question to you is: When you design and plan for low-cost housing. I mean, I understood that flexibility becomes one, uh, uh, productive becomes another, but what are some of the parameters you keep in mind while designing for the low-income housing segment? So I'll give you another example. You know, we, we did housing for the Bengal uh, Ambuja group, uh, which was, you know, a, a builder group doing this with the in collaboration with the Bengal Housing Board. And there was a fixed cost to the house that you have to build in. And there was a fixed size. And it took a lot of convincing for them that when you stack up people, give them large terraces so that over time they can expand. Uh, the guy on the ground obviously expands. The guy on the first floor, if he has a terrace, well, he can add another room if the terrace is, terrace is large enough. And the guy on the second floor and the third floor also has to have this. So it's like a pyramid you're building. And on that pyramid, people are adding things and changing. And then the interesting thing, phenomena starts taking place. People start negotiating, neighbors start negotiating of how to add on. And I think that's part of the dynamics of a growth cycle in an economy like ours. There are, you know, uh, phases where things, people have money and there are phases that don't and they sort of are flexible to do this. So uh, uh, this, this model we had tested out even before in Ahmedabad in what is called uh, the LIC housing. And exactly the same thing happened. If you go there today, you don't recognize the original houses. People have not only personalized, but they've added so many things which you never thought were possible. But today, they're still well workable houses. And communities are formed because uh, what we did, we did a post-occupancy study a couple of years ago. 85% of the people stayed on because they said, hey, listen, we got to know people around us. We settled down there and our... Uh, the next generation said that because this was so good, we came back. So if you want to form communities, which is, I think, very critical when we talk about housing and affordability, you need to make good neighbors. Yeah. So my third question is, 
when you when you design for uh, the upper middle class or the middle class and you design for low income is there any difference in your approach other than i mean this community applies everywhere but is there any fundamental difference in the way you design yeah i, I think i'll take a, a word from what you just said a little earlier which is that you know middle class and the um, upper middle class they have specific functions for each room let's say well this is a bedroom this is a dining room this is a living room and you use it only for part of the day so in low income you say hey this is my living dining bed i roll out my mattress in the night i sleep out there in the daytime i use it as a place to sit out and i have two charpais there or whatever and it's uh, it's a sitting room and then uh, you know so the multi functional space as such becomes very very critical and how well designed it is to be able to take all those functions becomes very critical can you can you hear me yeah yeah go ahead go ahead yeah so so that that is the essential difference okay. that i think comes up when you design for one or the other nice. you have to much more sort of critical about the spaces that you're designing that they can be used in several ways rather than just as a as as uh, you know one designated space nice so manish uh, thank you manish uh, for for breaking out of your secretary uh, I no you have to with but to this is a very mine is a very critical set of questions to you you know everyone believes on for the economic sections of society the pradhan mantri awaz yojana launched by the honorable prime minister in 2010 was to address the makam disconnected question one to you what was your objective which was in six years down the road what are the outcomes yeah hi uh, hi everyone good evening i'm i'm really sorry for for the delay <clears throat> it's the government system sorry <laughs> uh great so uh, basically uh, if you talk about pradhan mantri awas you know i think more or less people are aware about the <clears throat> the scheme i think uh, in 2015 uh, uh, pradhan mantri launched this uh, scheme with a very clear vision that whoever is eligible in the urban areas and whoever is uh, willing to uh, have pakka house we will provide them uh, with all weather pakka house to all <clears throat> eligible urban households so that was the clear statement but that statement comes with lot of uh, you know uh, subsidiary parts <clears throat> one is we defined that what is uh, uh, all weather kacha, uh, pakka house so there were three four components which were added which were uh, uh, mandatory provision one was uh, it's a it's a obviously we've given a, a set of guidelines and uh, <clears throat> that house should have a uh, water supply toilet electricity kitchen and uh, bathroom so those uh, five or six elements were given as a as a mandate to us and uh, that was the the entire program was designed on the basis of that uh, tg12 uh, <coughs> report so uh, the the second mandate was very clear that you know uh, it is entirely a democratic scheme uh, uh, unlike the uh, previous schemes where states used to come to the central government for approval and other things it is uh, the 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 process was entirely opposite uh, it was given to us that it is a state government scheme uh, so they own it and uh, we are here to just uh, support the state government as part of our uh, central assistance so there are uh, four components of this scheme i think people are aware and uh, <clears throat> those out of those four components uh those components were actually designed as a cafeteria approach wherein we provided people options that which options you want to buy we want uh, you want to select so the first option was affordable housing in partnership which is a multi story uh, uh, building second is entirely a slum uh, rehabilitation project which is again a multi story and third is blc which is beneficiary led construction and that's a super eight program a super eight component because most of our in fact 80% or of our uh, approvals and houses are uh, are from the blc category so uh, <clears throat> so the program uh, of blc is basically uh, you know uh, uh, bringing the uh, entire pmoi in the picture in fact 
and obviously the fourth part was a CLSS, which is a central scheme where uh, you have the central uh, interest subsidy. I think uh, uh, people are aware if you have any questions, I, I can uh, give you the answer. But yes, the idea was that, uh, you know, the, the preconceived notion was people always wanted to make houses, wherein some of the schemes gave them entire grant to make a house. <clears throat> but in PMAY, what we actually tried is that you have to make a house, you do it, uh, there are three parties. One is beneficiary, one is state government, third is uh, uh, central ministry. So the idea was to, to, to make all stakeholders contribute for that house so that people can own it. So here there is a contribution of central ministry, which is called as central assistance. There is a contribution of state government or uh, union territory governments. And third, obviously, beneficiary has to contribute. So the willingness to pay was always there, but we actually gave them a push that you you actually make a house, we will provide you with some of the uh, central assistance. So that was the, the, the criteria. If you talk about the outcomes, I'm very happy to share that uh, uh, we actually uh, validated the entire TG12 demand out of uh, 18 million. Uh, we, we actually validated through states and it's 11.2 million. And government of India has <clears throat> sanctioned the entire 100% demand so far. Nice. Last month we had our last meeting of approval. So we approved entire 100% demand, number one. Number two, out of the approved demand, uh, nearly 8 million are in progress, are on ground, which is, which is exemplary. In fact, within the given timeline, uh, this was the progress which was shown uh, by the state government. And we take some of the credit. Obviously, out of 8 million, uh, <clears throat> we have finished 4.8 million and we have completed and we have delivered to the beneficiaries. So this is a huge, huge housing yeah. program. So this mm -hmm. is this is in in nutshell. Yeah. So Manish, tell me what is the difference between affordable housing and low income housing? Because my research showed me an affordable housing in Bombay can be one crore. Yes. And there is a lot of you know a lot of the startups who come to us and say, hey, can you tell me the difference between the two? You're the best person to. Ask. You know, uh, uh, as a as a as a professional, <laughs> I, I can give you an answer uh, which is more or less uh, exactly what you think. But uh, being from the government side, we normally don't dif uh, differentiate between these things. These are all nuances. PMAY scheme is, uh, uh, it has a very clear statement that we provide affordable housing. And in fact, whatever the definition state government promises to, uh, to, to make <clears throat> or the, or the uh, 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 criteria state government decides, decides, we will approve it. So basically, in terms of PMAYC affordability, I think uh, I think it's a thumb rule that uh, <clears throat> uh, if you if you if you invest uh, uh, one third of your household income uh, uh, on on housing, uh, that's called affordable. Yes, but in in uh, as far as PMAY is concerned, we uh, we don't discriminate and we we just have a categorize categorization. What we do is uh, we have a categorization of uh, economically weaker section. So housing for EWS sections. Second, we have a, a category of low income group. So this is all defined in terms of uh, household income. So EWS comes within zero to three lakh rupees per month, uh, per year, uh, three to six comes under LIG. And then again, obviously up to uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, 18 lakh, we have two categories in medium uh, income, uh, mid income category, which is MIG one and MIG two. So that applies under the CLSS vertical, but yes. Uh, I think <clears throat> when we when we talk about affordability, uh, uh, we've seen uh, the if you if you just uh, uh, give me one minute, we've seen the the prices of houses. You know how it actually differentiate between states to its states. Uh, Maharashtra, we have uh, the highest uh, housing price uh, in terms of PMAY. What we approve it is is fourteen lakh. So that's affordable for them. Uh, Mizoram, uh, we have approved houses of two lakh rupees. That's the maximum they 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 think. So that's affordable for them. So we we are just governed by the by the guidelines. So that's okay. that's that's about it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm now going to move to uh, the specific topic of the day on technology. And sure. to all the people who are here, please type in your questions. And Gautam, if I may request you on a Jeep, request you at the end of the session to ask questions to specific panelists. It'll be great. Now coming to technology. Uh, starting with you, Lizanne, uh, are you at a global level seeing enthusiasm from technology startups to address challenges and issues in this sector? 
Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. We do see um, that there are a lot of innovations. Um, of course, I hope we hope as well that our work and also um, your work will result to even more innovations. Um, I can give some specific examples. Um, I was I touched that already before. So, for example, circular economy and, and climate change. We do see an increase globally um, of of PET, which is um, used to build or you know, used to um, have bricks then. But then we also see, you know, besides of like um, construction technology, we also see intersections of, um, for example, financial technology, which is coming in and is being used as well in, 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 in the affordable housing sector. So for example, Gradana, um, they are a leading property related P2P financing platform in Indonesia. Um, they're offering, for example, loans for mortgage rental and renovation and invoicing finan financing. So, um, and they, for example, also see um, a quite a big growth in the last uh, few months. So for sure in the entire pipeline, we do see more innovations in terms of products and services which are arising. Okay. Rajiv, in your vast and diversified experience, where do you think smart enterprising entrepreneurs can add value to, I like your term, productive, flexible ha habitat? Uh, I, I think uh, one is that organizationally, people need to, in this segment, whoever is operating, need to be better organized. Uh, I think part of the problem is that if you use the same construction technologies, the same ways of managing that construction, then I think, and the dependency on seasonal labor, et cetera, then I don't think we're going to progress very fast. So I believe that we need to change that, especially looking at the fact that today everything is on a digital platform. So when an architect produces a design, you can get, uh, you know, all the details, all the, you can uh, quantify things, things very precisely. So when you bid for a job, you can actually cut down on margins, which you took as unpredictable. So, so that's something that's, I think, very critical in the ways that we think about housing. Then, of course, there is new technologies like we, had, we can recycle waste and use that. We've used that in several small projects. We've recycled waste from slum, these things, and built out of that from bottles to uh, other waste, these things. We've used uh, earth construction. And, uh, of course, now you get very precise things like 3D printing and all coming up, which I think at the moment is expensive. But as it becomes more commonplace, because of the precision, you will get the cost will go down. Hmm. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, besides, of course, you know, precast, prefabrication technology, so your time cycles reduce in terms of construction. Uh, and in, in newer materials like, you know, uh, cross laminated timber, etc., which are also being now uh, used all over. And... Uh, those, if they start coming in, also will start reducing the ways that we look at things. At the moment, again, there's an affordability component, but I think in the long term, these are things that we should be looking at. For instance, we grow a lot of bamboo, mm. and it could also be made out of bamboo. I mean, the whole Northeast is full of black bamboo, right. and we should be looking at this as a productive way of uh, producing, you know, using that technology. Great. Um, <clears throat> Manish, you were... You've been actively involved with global housing technology challenge, uh, construction technology India. Uh, what has been your observation about the role of startups in this low-income affordable housing sector? Is there enthusiasm? Are you seeing startups? Let me just skip. Yeah, Manish, are you seeing startups in the low-income affordable housing segment? I mean, you are part of. Uh, oh yes, global? yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, in fact, the the entire uh, journey of global housing technology challenge. Uh, we've seen uh, two major stakeholders. One is the proven technology providers from globally. And second is startup, which is from India. So that was the restriction. But yes, we've seen a lot of excitement. I think uh, you are aware uh, uh, global housing technology challenge has a specific component about the, uh, the, the startup. And we call it Asha India. That's called Affordable Sustainable Housing Accelerator. And we actually invited a lot of uh, applications for... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, from the from the uh, startups <clears throat> under different domains, and it was a very short term uh, thing. But yes, we got 80 applications uh, uh, last year, and uh, most of the startups were uh, were into affordable housing segment only. 
so uh, so so there are two components one is uh, uh, and that idea actually came directly from the honorable prime minister uh, this was uh, under two category one is uh, a pre prototype and second was post prototype so obviously we are uh, we've seen lot of uh, uh, people uh, startups entrepreneurs who are actually uh, who actually applied through our uh, our portal and otherwise also so we do get lot of queries and lot of uh, uh, emails and questions to government of india that how actually we can associate with that because there are two uh, you know benefits uh, of those those associations one is we we will give them uh, appropriate uh, you know institutional approval of the of the of the technology that is called pax technology so pax approval is there and second we also provide uh, you know uh, incubation uh, of those technology which are not market ready and we actually have a partnership with four iits and uh, one nest uh, jorhat so we these these uh, centers are called incubation centers so this is for everyone who is listening and who is uh, willing to uh, uh, catch up with government of india and associate with us uh, under rasha program uh, uh, please write to us please give us your uh, your your uh, your product detail and we'll we'll try and associate you with uh, with the iits if you are uh, you know, a pre prototype and we will uh, make you uh, incubate your technologies for one full year with some of the grants also financial grants also and second if you are market ready uh, and if you are willing to go to the market we'll also provide accelerator uh, support to the to the technologies under the same component with the with the uh, with the uh, experts like john in fact uh, uh, is aware and he can he can give you the 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 uh, broader framework but yes uh, we we do have a uh, in fact uh, it's a new system that we have established and we we've given the 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 platform and we've established it fully and we will have it uh, every year program for uh, calling the applications of startup but yes as far as interest is concerned we do get lot of interest and uh, most of the uh startups in fact i was not aware that uh, there is a, a, a hemp technology you can do yeah. something of housing uh, with the hemp so uh, a lot of uh, and once there is a second benefit once we approve it if uh, if that technology or the 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 product is is registered with us in fact the concerned state government also takes lot of interest and then you you actually get into the system because ultimately you have to do something with the state government only so once you 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 get into the system state government takes lot of interest they give you lot of financial assistance also apart from our 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 assistance so yes we do we do get in fact money uh, next question to you is on the you know many when we when many startups realize that we are going to be doing the session and we have somebody from the government I, they wrote to us individually saying john we are very wary of dealing with government first of all getting to the right person then you know we don't know what jamela we go through what is your comfort to be given to startups because they are the crux of solving difficult challenges innovatively what is your assurance to them uh, no in fact <laughs> you see uh, what we have done we we uh, when i say we it's is the government that i am employing uh, there is a set protocol you know there is a set system so there is a technical evaluation committee which is there in the ministry and we also have a association with niti aayog and other thing so whatever product or details we get uh, through applications or through uh, through emails or whatever they need to be reviewed very carefully that is the direction and that uh, evaluation committee is a is a expert committee within the ministry and from outside world also they actually have a lot of interaction with those people and there is a rigorous process of evaluation and once they pass with the evaluation process and if the product has 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 a, a weight in that and if it is actually a, 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 a good product and it is not limited to affordable housing mind you and it it can be anything any element of also, uh, affordable housing that can be there so so there is a system established here uh, we normally uh, every year uh, we call formal applications uh, for the system uh, for the for the for the people to apply in the system but yes otherwise also any one who is interested can come down to our office in fact it's a it's a open uh, system and if it is uh, uh, it is restricted and it feels restricted there is a associated agency of government of india in fact uh, for for mahua for our ministry it's called bmtpc building materials and technology promotion council kindly uh, record this statement uh, 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 and and the name and details of that uh, agency it's it's called building material and technology promotion council bmtpc you can any time write to them they are the agency who actually does it and all the approvals are given from that only so you can actually apply write to them give them a presentation have a appointment fixed 
mark a copy to us you know uh, it's it's all online it's nothing is hidden these days so you you know all the email ids and phone numbers and everything just give them a call and uh, you know mark a copy and we will follow it up we are actually very keen asha india is something that uh, you know anyone can log on to internet and uh, just see uh, on our prime minister's speech on asha india whatever he has said uh, and whatever he has uh, directed to us it's something that we are willing to follow and we have to follow because we have seen the success we have seen the results and it's actually uh, magnificent nice in fact i must i must share on record here that when we launched uh, the world top tech summit mm. it just required one email to shri hardeep singh puri and he yes, was sir. open to actually addressing the gathering that's true uh, the, the honorable deputy cm of karnataka one mail so very very responsive and manish thank you so much for giving the assurance because startups have this issue um rajiv question to you can you share examples where projects designed by by vastu shilp where technology has intervened to make a significant difference uh, one, I, okay this will sort of take us back in time a little bit because okay. what i'm going to be talking about is something that is uh, is not a new invention it's a very old thing it is using mud it is using earth uh, we are doing the nalanda university in rajgir bihar it is a 455 acre campus and we uh, the, our rainwater harvesting tanks we have excavated the earth from that and we made them into compressed soil earth blocks wow almost 2 crores of those okay there are two two main prime contractors who have set up ma- manufacturing plants on site excavating the thing the rainwater collects out there and the earth is used for construction of the buildings so uh, it's something that's so easy to do in large parts of our country that you use the local soil you don't have to even burn bricks you can use them directly and uh, uh, so that's something that we have recently been doing and we got to test the advantage is though it's an old technology at this scale has never been done before so for that we had the iits we had the nirma institute of engineering all of them participate in testing all of this in different weather conditions with different tests for it so that it over time it can last for a long time and uh, uh, you know it's something that uh, you're using something that's locally available so it's very very sustainable in that sense. um lizan back to you you know we've seen globally we've seen applications in health tech e-commerce where startups from global have come to india startups from india are going global do you think uh, in this in the technology for affordable housing space startups from india can actually take their products and solutions global Absolutely. I mean, um, we see, as an example, um, Tavasta. So this is the India's first concrete three D printer, which who built a house in just five days and cut cons- um, construction co- costs by thirty percent. And um, for example, they were just recognized by the World Economic Forum as one of the promising three D companies globally. So. they are for sure startups in india who can but who do have the potential to go global i sometimes wonder if this is really necessary um if we really think that scalability into other countries is a must have i'm not sure also not if we are looking at like you know impact investors coming in um i think it is crucial actually that um as a startup we see problems which 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 are in our reality um which we then really can solve on a high quality and um also you know in india is such a huge market i'm not i'm not even sure if you would need to go um globally but the potential is for sure there okay so question to you again shelter tech has made several investments in promising startups in india and globally including one in the brigade reap startup mm-hmm. what's your advice to startups looking to raise money in the affordable housing sector mm. i think um so we are looking or we are working a lot of times um uh, with impact investors it's crucial to already measure from the start or being very intentional on the impact measurements you want to achieve or the impact you want to achieve and really show these numbers besides of like the financial numbers which have to be there as well of course right we are talking about capital financial numbers have to be there but besides of that the impact measurements or the impact numbers are crucial too um and i think also i think this is not just towards affordable housing but just in general um investments too so it's not just 
you know, the, the startups who are seeking for funding and, um, you know, are trying to get funding, but it's really also the VCs or the investors who are trying to invest into the best um, startups in the market. So as a startup, you also have quite a power um, and you can also choose your um, VC or your impact investor wisely and you should do so. Nice, thank you. Uh, Rajiv, question to you. There's common perception that low income segment works on wafer thin margins. I'm not probing into your business model, but do you think there's money to be made <laughs> for startups and other stakeholders in this, in this market? Can't, Rajiv, you're on mute. Yeah. yeah, I absolutely think that there is money to be made. I mean, uh, you know, not, the world goes around because people make money some way or the other. They may make less or more. That's a different story. But the fact is that people make a living out of things. And I, I think waste is like a gold mine. So the same way, I mean, affordable or this thing, uh, you know, low cost housing, uh, there is a product, there is a thing that you're putting in into it. So it has to cost some money and somebody is going to make something out of it. So the more efficiently you do it, the more better organized you are, I, I see a lot of opportunity out there. In fact, it's a huge segment. I mean, it's the largest segment in this country. And uh, if you go to South America and Africa, again, I think there are huge segments. So things that have been tried and tested in India will, uh, believe you me, they'll last anywhere. So I, I think there is, there is a huge potential out here. Thank you so much. Manish, um, you've been in the thick of things with the government, with startups in this space. Uh, share two challenges that present lucrative business opportunities for technology for startups to address in this segment. Okay. No, in fact, <clears throat> I don't know about the challenges, but what, what I've seen and what I've experienced, I can share with that. Uh, we don't see a lot of uh, startups coming, with, uh, coming up with, uh, with the technology options. We, we've not uh, came across uh, uh, with those, those kind of startup. Uh, we've seen applications and you know, people writing uh, to us about uh, uh, you know, making a lift uh, with, with, with some of the technology or, or doing some lighting with, with remote control. That doesn't solve our problem. So mm -hmm. it, we, we need some of the housing components, some of the, either uh, it is beam column, walling or whatever components is there. We don't know uh, if we are uh, willing to accept the, the innovation in, in tap water or the, the, the toilet facility. But yes, uh, 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 so, so, so we, we uh, if I think uh, we've not come across, number one. And second is uh, in government sector, uh, people... Uh, this is, this is out of the context, but yes, what I've experienced is uh, in public sector, in fact, in government, uh, core government, people don't accept uh, out of the box challenges, you know, out of the box ideas. Uh, it's, it's very difficult for, for the government people to, to make uh, them realize, make them accept and make them willing to go ahead with the, with the, with the product. So uh, this is this is not acceptable. This, this doesn't fit under our mandate and all. So they don't normally... Uh, 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 you know they are not willing to to uh, go ahead with the with the with the kind of product if it is out of the box after the idea is brilliant yes but if it, it, it is not uh, within the line of the uh, system it's it's very difficult for them to to make them understand so that's that's something very difficult but yes things are changing Honest. very good things are changing so i'm going to end this session with a rapid fire question three questions again in my format um, so, you know, we'll start with ladies first, Lizanne, Rajiv, Manish. Um, when I say the words technology and affordable housing, what's the one word that comes to your mind, Lizanne? Shelter tech. <laughs> <laughs> That's great promotion. Rajiv? <laughs> Rajiv. <laughs> That's smart. <laughs> Rajiv? Um, I think open-ended. Open-ended. Okay, that's two words, but okay. Eh? Manish? I think it's most possible that I would want to possible. say. Okay, great. Most possible, yes. Is there a need for disruptive technology intervention in the disruptive technology? And I'm not talking, Rajiv, just materials, but, you know, money talked of, you know, lighting, but, you know, there are lighting companies who can actually save 30% in energy costs in any building. Uh, there is a company that we have which is saving billions of liters of water. It reduces operational costs. Yeah. So is there a need for disruptive technology intervention in the affordable housing sector? Yes, Absolutely. no, maybe. No. Absolutely. Lizanne? 
Yes, there are 1.6 billion people who would say so too. <laughs> nice. Uh, Manish? Yeah, yeah, undeniably. It's, it's, okay. it's brilliant. Uh, okay. Do you think disruptive prop tech startups can create sustainable, scalable, and investable businesses in this sector? And Manish, you've seen it. Rajiv, you would have companies coming to you. And Lizanne, you've definitely seen it. So yes, absolutely. It has already proven, and I think it's the role of all of us, including the audience, that we make this known as well in the world and in the innovation ecosystem, that prop tech and you know, affordable housing is crucial. Okay. Rajiv? 100%, I think there is opportunities. Yeah. And money? I, uh, absolutely. Money. I think uh, I would add one more sentence. It's a, it's a way to Atmirvar Bharat, I'm telling you. Okay, absolutely. So, 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 ladies and gentlemen, on on the on in the audience, you've heard government, you've heard one of India's most prolific designers, you've heard a, a, a lady who represents uh, amongst the most powerful uh, uh, catalyst for affordable housing technology. Speak. This is a great opportunity. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw open questions. We've got a lot of questions. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, a question that's come from Mira. What are the issues, and Manish, this is for you. What are the issues in the implementation of PMA, construction completion technology can solve? Uh, what are the limitations, did you ask? What are the issues in the implementation of... Oh. See, uh, I think uh, if, I, if I just uh, separate the, the individual housing category of PMAYU, but then uh, apart from that PMAYU section, if it is about the, the uh, Greenfield project, the first and foremost challenge and issues are land issues. One, uh, which is which is mostly related with the uh, encroachment free land. So we we we've seen projects coming up to us. Uh, we we get approval also, but then uh, you know there are issues with uh, typical issues with land, and it's associated with a lot of uh, legalization. You know legal issues and uh, you know court cases and all. So we don't want people to plan anything on the on the uh, uh, issues uh, where uh, you have uh, uh, conflict and other things. So that is number one. Number two. A uh, lot of state governments doesn't want to do uh, a multi-story housing, you know. So that's uh, that's some of the uh, uh, the the state government's uh, you know limitation. In fact, so what they do is they want to do row housing, and uh, uh, and we've seen situation where a lot of uh, governments have actually uh, proposed to us that whatever we've got in terms of multi-story housing, we want to change it and we want to make a, a you know row housing. So that's something I don't know uh, if uh, the concept can be different. So they don't want people to live on the on the third floor or twenty fourth floor. So that's the uh, the conception. So entire planning and all the uh, issues uh, comes there. So and obviously funding is something that uh, that that is there. But yes, we are uh, here to take care of that. But these two things, I think, uh, 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 major issues that we 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 fall. We we had issues about permissions also. But yes, we we tried and we managed a lot of those issues about the uh, building plan approval and time bound approval of those things. Uh, uh, so uh, I don't see those uh, issues are coming up with us, but yes, uh, land and uh, those uh, planning issues are there. Yes. Rajiv, this question to you, is affordable housing supply side problem or demand side problem? You've talked to a lot of customers, a lot of, you're doing a lot of work. Do you think there's enough? Is it a supply side or demand side problem? I think it's an interesting question. Well, I think it's a supply side problem, isn't it? I mean, if I understand yeah. your question, right, uh, the yeah. demand there is a huge demand. I, I think there is two issues involved here. One is the uh, affordability part of it. The second part of it is access to loans and finance. I mean, I think as that sort of has changed over the years, I mean, I remember from the 80s to now, there's been a huge sea change in affordability of and uh, access to, uh, you know, uh, finance. And I think that's made a difference in the ways that the homeowners have sort of reacted to this. So uh, I, I think it's a, it's a problem about the supply at the Lord moment. Supply. Lizanne, question to you. Where is India's affordable housing ecosystem and innovation particular compared to others globally? <laughs> I think this is quite a hard question. I think what, what we see um, a bit as well is also the acceptance of the, of the innovations um, in the countries, especially also if you're talking about 
um, new materials or or standards. Um, I think that that's, for example, the uh, area of opportunity we can still also focus on in India. Okay. But again, okay. we are having experts here with Manish and, and you as well, who can, could answer these questions too. Sure. Uh, question to you again, with many new initiatives of Lizanne, especially with tech and housing failing at customer acceptance test, mainly their aspiration needs, how does one overcome this challenge? Yeah, that's, that's actually such a good question. So, um, you know, I think people in general are quite risk averse as well. So um, it, it will take time for new materials um, as well in the, you know, in building a house. We had the same story with, for example, mobility, uh, you know, acceptance of electric cars, for example, or um, even internet was at the beginning really not accepted. It will take time. And I think also um, to provide a systemic change on all levels um, is crucial and has to be thought through. Okay. Manish, specific question to you. Does PMA recognize modular prefab construction as pakka construction? Yes, we do. Okay. That's right. <laughs> Um, okay, how can NGOs access the mission towards housing for all along with the government? I think, Manish, this question will be targeted to you. See, uh, it's not about only NGOs, any community-based organization or any, uh, any organization which works with the community. Uh, we, we normally uh, see uh, a lot of association with NGOs and uh, community-based organizations under the specific vertical of uh, ISSR, which is for the slum dwellers. So where you, what you need is uh, the existing slum dwellers are, uh, they are told to be evicted. They, they want to be, uh, they, they are given a new house. So they need to be evicted. And then uh, where uh, the community-based organizations roles uh, comes. So we've seen excellent example of this association in Gujarat, obviously uh, with Seva and other NGOs. Uh, and we, we normally highlight and uh, uh, we do a lot of case studies about this association, but yes, uh, by far uh, we've seen less association with NGOs and other people uh, in, okay. in PMAY. But yes, we are willing to do that. If uh, uh, it's a state project, state government can be approached, ULBs can be approached. We are always there, we can be approached. Uh, we, uh, we will have a, a, a specific discussion about the specific states. So that's, that's something that we community participation, we encourage. Because unless we do uh, something of this sort, we will not be able to do uh, housing for all. So that's, that's yeah. the statement. So Rajiv, this question is to you. How do you, you know, when you're building communities, especially large, uh, you know, on hectares of land and you're doing it for the EWS, how do you ensure people's participation in the design process? Rajiv, you're on mute. You're on mute. Uh, what we have tried to do is, in all these instances, is to make community groups, have community sort of uh, discussions. We make little models, work with the uh, you know participants, and say, okay, here are you know this is ways you can arrange things. This is the way that you can be next to your uncle, your aunt, your this thing because a lot of these community groups also are related to families, and so how do you sort of do this kind of a thing as an active sort of workshop? with, with uh, community groups is the challenge. And uh, a lot of our experience was gained also during the earthquake uh, rehabilitation after the Gujarat earthquake, where we worked with several such uh, uh, NGOs and communities. And uh, they actively participated in the ways that they wanted things laid out, the changes that they wanted what, from what their earlier village was or their little township was, town was. So it, that was, uh, it's a hands-on thing that you have to do with communities. I think we are out of time. We've over time by about 10 minutes. I must thank all of you, Lizanne, Rajiv, Manish. I think it's been a very, very insightful session for me. Um, and to start up, we have launched a travel for housing. Uh, uh, we will reach out to people like Rajiv, um, uh, Manish, Lizan, you're in the space anyway, to take your help in helping start a startup navigate through this process. Because we believe there's a large problem to be solved here. And this is a problem that only... The, 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 
the profits uh, in this space are huge. I mean, 29 million homes to be built. Imagine the technology that can go into save. Even if you save 2%, that's a lot of money that can be saved for the country, for the people, and that's money for startups to be made. And there's a lot of social impact investing coming in. You know, Shelter Tech Habitat has come in. They've already invested in several startups. So this ecosystem is right. There are mentors at Brigade Reap, at Shelter Tech, who are going to work with you. Uh, and, you know, our applications for cohort pair are opening, uh, have opened. We will shut in the next three days. We have a separate track uh, for affordable housing. So do apply and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you again, Rajiv, Manish, and Lizanne. I think it's been a very, very insightful session for all of us. And thank you, people, for participating. Do watch out for Trench Talks on Tuesdays. We do it one Tuesday a month. We have interesting sessions coming up, and we'll have people like, like the three that you saw today. Thank you so much again. Uh, God bless. Stay safe. And take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John. John and, Thank you. Entire team. All the best. Thank, thank you.